luck to try to get through today. Um, act two. We didn't start Act Two, correct? I'm not showing that we started it. Um, so we're in a room at Polonius' house. Polonius comes in, and he's talking to with Reynaldo. We're just told his man. Okay. <clears throat> what is he asking Reynaldo to do, or what task is he giving Reynaldo? He's sending him to Paris to spy on his son. Remember the last time we saw Laertes, Polonius was giving him his advice, his precepts, before he heads back to Paris to continue his university studies. Now we bring in, or now we meet Reynaldo, and they kind of have a long discussion, and Polonius tells Reynaldo how to go about his job of spying on um, Laertes, okay? He sends Reynaldo off, and Ophelia comes in. He says, how now, Ophelia, what's the matter? He says that because when she comes in, she looks distressed, she's troubled by something. And she says, oh, my Lord, my Lord, I've been so frightened. He says, what in the name of God? And she talked about Hamlet. So. She was sewing in her room, her closet, as she calls it, and Hamlet comes in. Now bear in mind, the last time we saw Polonius and Ophelia together, he gave Ophelia strict instructions. Break off all contact with Hamlet. Don't let him come see you. So she says, as I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all embraced, and he's got glosses down here talking about you know, the various things, his close-fitting coat, unbraced means unfastened or untied, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, unguarded, and down jived to his ankle, that is, fallen down to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking each other, and with a look so piteous and purport, as if he'd been loosed out of hell to speak of horrors, he comes before me. <clears throat> Everything she's just described are symptoms in the Middle Ages and Renaissance of love sickness. It was an actual medical diagnosis, okay? Because what have we seen? Hamlet, we're told, comes in with his doublet and brace. Now, your, your gloss tells you a close-fitting coat. Sometimes it's a coat with sleeves. Sometimes it's like a vest, okay? But it's very skin-tight, and it's got these little buttons that you have to spend a lot of time on. So that's all unbuttoned. What else? He's not wearing a hat. A gentleman wears a hat in the presence of a woman. Um, his stockings aren't tied by the garters up here. They're just falling down, so she sees his bare legs. That is what is pale, by the way. His knees are knocking together, and he's got this you know, horrendous, this piteous look on his face. Polonius, mad for thy love. Mad, crazy, not mad, angry. She says, I do not know, but I do, truly I do fear it. What did he say? So she says, he took me by the wrist, so he grabbed her by the wrist, held me hard, and he goes to the length of all his arm. So he has her arm, and he goes all the way out like this, holds her at a distance, and the implication is her arm is also extended. And with his other hand thus o'er his brow, he falls to such perusal of my face. So he's holding her like this, and he does like this, like he's trying to shade the glare of the sun. He falls to such perusal of my face as I would draw it. Long steady so. At last, a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head thus waving up and down, he raised a sigh, so pitiful, profound, blah, 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 and he lets her go and does what? He walks away towards the door. With his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eye. That is, he's walking this way towards the door, but he's looking backwards. Like he doesn't want to ever take his eyes off her. We gotta go talk to the king. What were Hamlet's last words to Horatio Marcellus Bernardo? Horatio Marcellus and Bernardo? If from 
this point on, if I act like I'm putting on an antic disposition, don't give anything else, okay? Question, is this part of Hamlet's antic disposition? And if it is, I'm not saying it is, I'm asking. If it is, why is he doing it to Ophelia? She's the daughter of Polonius. It'll get back to him, okay? In other words, what's Hamlet doing with Ophelia? If that's true. He's kind of using her, all right? It's gonna be important because something's gonna come up very quickly. So, we gotta go see the king. Why? This is the very ecstasy of love. Ecstasy literally means out of body. The soul leaves the body, okay? Here, it has a much more specific meaning, and it means the mind has left the body. He's loony for love, whose violent property foredoes itself and leads the will to desperate undertakings as oft as any passion under heaven. That is, when someone who is crazy, mad for love, sometimes does things against the body. He's suggesting suicide. I am sorry. Have you given any hard work? Why does he say, I am sorry? I think maybe I was wrong. <laughs> maybe I misread Hamlet from what your previous words were. She says, no, I haven't given him any hard work. I, as you commanded, I repelled his letters and denied his access to them. That hath made him mad. I am sorry that with better heed and judgment I had not cloaked in him. That is, when I told you what Hamlet was doing, his whole thing about springs to catch woodcocks, he's saying, I am sorry that I wasn't more accurate. Before he thought Hamlet only, Hamlet only wanted to have sex with her. Now he's suggesting Hamlet really does love you. I feared he did but trifle and meant to rack thee. You know what the rack is? It's a wheel, or sometimes it's one wheel, sometimes it's two wheels, and you have your legs tied to one wheel and your upper body tied to the other wheel, and the two wheels are turned in opposing directions. The rack was an instrument of torture in the Tower of London. Literally was used, and people died on it because their legs and shoulders would be dislocate, dislocated. And if they didn't stop soon enough, they would literally be pulled off. All right? He means rack, however, as in getting your rack, sleeping compartment, your bed. He meant to bed you. Okay? But he says, you know, and the reason I thought that was because I'm an old man and I forgot what it was like to be young. So let's go see the king. Scene two. We have the king and queen come in. We have Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in. And the king welcomes them. He says, you've heard a little bit about Hamlet's, as he calls it, line five, transformation. So call it. Sith, since or because neither the exterior nor the inward man resembles what it was. In other words, Hamlet has really changed. He's changed inwardly, his behavior, and outwardly, his appearance. The implication is Hamlet hasn't always worn black, which he does now. Okay? What it should be more than his father's death that thus put him. So much from the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. Notice, Claudius is suggesting this is more than just his father's death that's caused this. There's got to be more. Okay? So, why did he send for Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? Spy on Hamlet. Okay? By your companies to draw him onto pleasures and to gather so much. Lines 13 and following. As much as from occasion you may glean, whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus, that open, that is the thing that's hidden from us, that once known, lies within our remedy. How can we help Hamlet? We, the royal we, I. Okay? 
So the queen begs them and says, you are the two closest people to Hamlet. Sure I am two men there are not living to whom he more adheres. Okay, so go to them. They agree. They leave, Polonius comes in with Gertrude. And some others, okay. Voltamon comes in with Cornelius. The king gives them orders, they leave. Polonius then addresses the king and says, line 86, my liege and madam to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night, night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste day, night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, in tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Notice, he has taken about eight lines to be brief, because he's not brief. What was one of his key words of advice to his son? Give your thoughts no tongue. And he seemingly speaks to the king and queen everything that comes into his mind. Okay? Your noble son is mad. Mad calling it for to define true madness. What is it but to be nothing else but mad? In other words, how could you define true lunacy? What does the, the word define literally mean? It doesn't mean explain means to put limits around, to put a boundary around it. He says, if someone is truly mad, you can't put a boundary about them. Okay? Part of not being mad is having controls, so to speak. So the queen, more matter with less art. Get to the point, drop the rhetoric. That's what she means. Okay? So he's, you know, a little offended by what she says and says I'm not using rhetoric anyway he goes on perpend which means consider <clears throat> line 106 I have a daughter have while she is mine go back to Midsummer Night's Dream Theseus Aegeus Aegeus says I have a daughter you know who in her duty and obedience Mark has given me this and he shows them a letter it's a letter from Hamlet to Ophelia with a poem Okay. And he, you know, criticizes the content. And the king finally asks, how hath she received his love? And what he really means is, does Ophelia reciprocate? Does Ophelia feel the same? Polonius, what do you think of me? A uh, man faithful and honorable. I would fain prove so. What might you think when I'd seen this hot love on the wing? What might you, or my dear majesty the queen here, think if I played the desk or table book or given my heart a winkling mute and dumb? His point is, what would you think if I acted like a table, if I didn't do anything? Again, think social status. What is Polonius and his family to the king and queen and Hamlet? subject. What would you think if I, he's suggesting, encouraged my daughter? This can never happen. She's a commoner. Hamlet's a prince, okay? Or looked upon this love with idle sight. What might you think? He says, no. I, he doesn't give them an opportunity to finish, which is going to be interesting because later on, the queen is going to imply that if Ophelia is able to draw out Hamlet's problem and help heal Hamlet, that she might end up being able to marry Hamlet. Okay? So he says, I went round to work, and I told my daughter, Hamlet is a prince, he's out of thy star. This cannot be. Okay? I told her, don't admit him to your room, don't have trouble talk with him, etc. And that led to his madness. King, do you think it does? The queen, yeah, probably. Polonius, has there been such a time that I pos positively said tis so and it was otherwise? In other words, 
Have I ever said something and been wrong? King, not that I know of. Then take this from this. He points to his head and then to his body. Take my head from my body. Kill me. If I'm wrong now. It's foreshadowing, folks. King's not going to take his head from his body. Nobody's going to literally take his head from his body. But he is going to die because he is wrong. How may we try it further, the king asks. 158. Try it. What does he mean by the word try? You get accused of some wrong. How do you respond? Prove it. That's what he means. Okay? So, Hamlet says, you know he walks in the lobby for four hours at a time often. At such a time, line 161, I'll loose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind an heiress then, mark the encounter, if he love her not, and be not from his reason fallen thereon, let me be no assistant for stay. If I'm wrong, if we watch this interview between them, and I'm wrong, he says, fire me, make me a farmer. Okay? But what I'm interested in, there are two things in that little speech. I'll loose my daughter to him. We only use that verb in that way really in only <coughs> one context. You loose something on something else. What's the first thing you loose? Dogs. I'm going to say, loose the dogs on Fox, whatever. There's another line from Shakespeare, let loose the dogs of war. That is, let war just blossom. He's describing his dog, his daughter, as a dog. Okay? It's going to be important. In just a moment, Hamlet's going to have a conversation with Polonius that's going to involve dead dogs and his daughter. Okay? And the other thing is, I'll lose my daughter, and what? You and I behind an heiress, then. Okay? Think of the stage. You've got two doors. The doors are usually have over them, you know, there's rods on either side, they go over the doors. Curtains, tall curtains. These are the heiress. So what does he say? You and I will hide behind the heiress, but what? We will mark the encounter. Meaning, even though we are hidden, we'll be able to observe everything. Okay? Hamlet comes in and he has a book. He's reading a book. It's not an accident that the very next, hold on, the very next scene. No, it's Act 3, beginning of Act 3, when Ophelia comes in. It's a couple hundred lines or so in. Ophelia is going to enter probably the same hall, lobby, and she's reading a book. Okay? So here we have Hamlet enter reading a book, and Polonius, to use the term Polonius use, uses, boards him. While... It's implied, possibly, the king and or queen, or at least the king, king we know does this, watches some of what is seen. Okay? So, they go away, and he says, I'll board him presently. Board is a naval military term, or also used by pirates. When you want to take over another ship, you... Position your ship alongside the ship you want to take, you want to commandeer. And you throw from your ship to that other ship a long board, <clears throat> 12 to 20 inches wide. That board has spikes on the end of it. So that when it hits the other ship, those spikes go into the railing or the deck of that other ship. 
So it kind of connects the two boats and you run across and take command. All right. So when he says, I'll board him presently, we've got a gloss down there, a cause. Even though he's not going to violently take control of Hamlet, violence is implied just in that use of that term, board. So, how does my good Lord Hamlet? Well, God of mercy. God have mercy is what God of mercy means. Do you know me, my Lord? Now, why would Polonius ask that question? Of course Hamlet knows him. He's the king's advisor. The implication, also, by the way, is that Polonius was King Hamlet's advisor. Okay? He probably says, do you know me, my lord? Because Hamlet doesn't look him in the eye. Hamlet just kind of, yeah, God have mercy. Do you know me, my lord? Excellent, well, yes, I, of course I know you. You're a fishmonger. Well, your gloss is a little misleading, okay? The word fishmonger has two meanings. It's, at least, it's literal dictionary definition. It's denotation is one who sells fish. Like an ironmonger, you can still go to places, you can go, in London, go to London today, you, will, you can go to shops that have fishmongers on it. You can go to shops that say ironmongers. They're what we would call a hardware store. Buy all kinds of stuff made out of steel, metal, and iron, okay? So it's just one who sells fish. The connotation, okay, the dirty connotation for a fishmonger, uh, we don't use the word bawd today, and we don't use the word procurer, unless you have a government position and you're in charge of procuring whatever for the military. Pimp is what's meant here. You are a seller of human flesh, not for a cleaning house. <laughs> You're a seller of sex. You're a seller of hookers, okay? Rent them by the hour, so to speak. Not I, my lord. Polonius knows exactly what Hamlet's talking about <coughs> in either of the two meanings. I don't sell fish, and I don't sell women either, or young boys even. Hamlet. Then I would you were so honest a man. What? Honest, my lord? That's what what means? Why do you go to a pimp or a madam? There's only one reason. You don't go to a pimp to get your car fixed. Even if the pimp's honest business is car, you know, car repair. You go to the pimp to buy sex. How is that being honest? You know what you're gonna get. Period. Okay? The pimp never tries to sell you something else. I, sir, to be honest as this one goes, is to be one man picked out of 10,000. Remember in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Puck up was, I think, who said that to be faithful is to be one in a million? Well, Hamlet, to be honest, true, loyal, all that kind of stuff, is to be one in 10,000. Oh, that's very true, my lord. Notice there's a point of agreement there between Polonius and Hamlet. Polonius is like, yeah, you're right. The world sucks, man. Everybody's lying and cheating. If the sun breed maggots in a dead dog, being a good kissing carrion, have you a daughter? What? Where did that come from? Where, you know, they're talking about fishmonging. Where does the sun come in? Where's the dead dog of maggots, etc.? Okay. Have you a daughter? For if the son breed maggots in a dead dog, being a good kissing carrion. There's an idea in the Renaissance and Middle Ages that the reason animal carcasses produce maggots is because the sun impregnates them. The sun inseminates them with stuff we can't see. <coughs> Because take a dead body, put it on that last table where we have sunlight there, in a couple of days, what's going to happen? It's going to be crawling with things. So notice, being out in the sun, OK, 
can cause one to have maggots. Have you a daughter? I have, my Lord. And I think Polonius should respond the way I just did. Very slowly, <laughs> very clearly, because he's thinking, what the hell are you thinking? Let her not walk in the sun. Why? She might breed maggots. Conception is a blessing. The Old Testament tells us so. All kinds of passages about how children are a blessing of God. Conception is a blessing, but as your daughter may conceive, friend, look to it. So, if your daughter's walking around out in the sun, she might get knocked up. There's also probably a pun going on here on um, the notion that women who spent a lot of time in the sun were streetwalkers, hookers. That's part of that you know, notion. When I pulled out that sheet of white paper a couple weeks ago, implying that's the ideal of beauty. Well, if you spend a lot of time out in the sun, you're not going to be paper white, all right? Poloni says an aside. Bear in mind, with an aside, the people on the stage don't hear these words. The audience does. Well, Hamlet doesn't hear him say, how say you by that? Still harping on my daughter? Still, always, continually, you mean you may not have talked said it was a fishmonger. He's far gone. Far gone. I do. I suffered much extremity from a very near this. Notice how that little aside tells us an awful lot more about Polonius than it does about Hamlet. What has Polonius just admitted? I was nearly as crazy for love, too. That is why he told Ophelia, don't listen to Hamlet. He wants one thing. Sex. It's because of Polonius's background that he said no. So, he says, I'll speak to him again. What do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. Very, you know, correct, right? I'm because that's what he's reading. W what is the matter? And he means, what is the matter of the words? What are the words about? Like, what's the title? <laughs> what's the subject? Hamlet takes what is the matter, however, to have the meaning we would probably usually use it to mean. If someone says to you, what is the matter? You say, with what? Or about what? So, same phrase, two exact different meanings. Hamlet, between who? Hamlet interprets what is the matter, my lord, to mean there's a problem, there's a conflict between two people. Remember the opening question? Who's there? Well, there is a matter, a topic, a subject between two people in the play, right? I mean, primarily between two people. The chief protagonist, the chief antagonist. Who's the chief antagonist? Claudius. Chief protagonist, it's Hamlet. Everybody else, they're just bit players. They're just ones orbiting these two suns that are entwined in this dance, so to speak. I, I mean the matter of that you read, my lord. That is, what is the subject material? And Hamlet tells him, slander, because it talks about old men doing certain things. Polonius responds again in an aside to the audience. Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. That is, what Hamlet has just said is sheer lunacy. But there's what to it? There's a method to it. There's a structure. There's an order. Sheer lunacy, you would expect to be entirely, to use a good modern term, discombobulated. Okay? Where the, the words wouldn't fit properly. 
Will you walk out of the air, my Lord? That is, will you come with me from this room and go out like <coughs> onto the balcony into the fresh air? Him, into my grave. It's true. When you go in the grave, you're out of the air, right? I mean, you're covered with dirt. Indeed, that's out of the air. <laughs> it's like, wow. And he gets a third aside. How pregnant sometimes his replies are. Pregnant how? Notice, by the way, Hamlet brought up the idea of pregnancy with conception and maggots and You see a woman who's pregnant. You don't usually notice first, second, sometimes third month. Eighth month, ninth month, everybody knows. What do you know is about to happen? Obviously. She's going to give birth. But you know also the big belly means something. There is a meaning to that. Okay? How pregnant his replies are means there is meaning to these replies. And what's the point? That meaning will burst forth at some point. All right? Which reason, uh, uh, how pregnant sometimes his replies are. A happiness that often madness hits on. Reason, and which reason and sanity could not so preposterously, but prosperously be delivered of. So he says, I'm going to leave him. And I'll get the means to loose my daughter to him. Okay, uh, my honorable lord, I must, I will most humbly take my leave of you. It's a British phrase; we don't use that in America. They still do use it somewhat in England. I will take my leave of you. That is, I've got to go now. But notice, my leave is something that I take. My absence from you is something I take. Hamlet. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all. You can't take your leave from me. Why? I freely, willingly grant it. Get the hell out of here. They, I take my leave. That is extremely polite. I, I, I'm sorry that I must leave you now, and I know you're going to be heartbroken. Is kind of what that implies. Because you will so miss my, my presence, Hamlet. No, just leave. But he doesn't stop there. So, you cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all, except my life, except my life, except my life. Notice, what can Polonius take from Hamlet? My life. Will he willingly part with all that? With all entirely. Notice, it's the thing Polonius can take that Hamlet is willing to part with. What can Hamlet not do? He can't part from his life. Why not? His first soliloquy. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would thaw, melt, resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. You can kill me, but I can't kill myself. Brought up to my first class. Have you heard of the phrase, um, suicide by cop? It's when someone wants to die, but they don't have the courage to take their own life. So what do you do? My brother-in-law used to be a cop for 27 years. He had all kinds of stories about this. You want to make sure a cop's going to kill you. Pull a gun on a cop. Without even thinking, they're going to shoot you. And they're not going to shoot for an arm or leg or foot. They're going to shoot for body mass. Why? You are an immediate threat, period. And if you're close enough, like I am to him, a knife will do. Pull a knife on a cop, and you're going to get shot. Okay? It's almost like Hamlet is saying, you know, I'm going to kill this guy now. Almost like. He's not necessarily saying that. Okay? So, 
Polonius leaves, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in. And Hamlet asks how they're doing. How do ye both? Rosencrantz, top of 1270, volume 219. As the indifferent children of the earth, your gloss says we're indifferent, ordinary. Could be ordinary. It could also mean uncaring. That is, not having a care in the world. Happy in that we are not over happy. On fortune's cap, we're not the very button. The idea of indifference here almost, almost is that stoic attitude that I've referred to before. Trying to maintain that even keel, right? So, happy in that we are not over happy. We're not the cap, we're not the button on fortune's cap. Fortune is portrayed two ways in literature. One, as a goddess, and two, as the wheel that she turns. It's where we get the TV show, game show, Wheel of Fortune. She holds this wheel, it's got a, you know, a um, axle in the middle, and she spins it. And that wheel represents the fortunes and the fates of your life, okay? When you're on, this, if the wheel's spinning this way, if you're on this way, life's getting better. If you're moving upwards, things are looking up. If you're at the top, it can be both good and bad. Why? Because once you reach the top, the wheel doesn't stop. Now, it might turn real slowly at first, but eventually it will speed up and you'll reach the bottom. That's the black pit of despair, so to speak, okay? So, they use the image of being on the top <coughs> of the goddess of fortune. We're happy in that we're not. The button on her cap, the very top, okay? Hamlet, nor the soles of her shoes. You're also not under the foot of fortune, that is. So you're not up here and you're not down here. Neither, my lord, Hamlet. <laughs> then you live about her waist or in the middle of her favors. <coughs> Gildenstern, <laughs> her private's we. That is, you're right, Hammett. We live around fortune's privates. In the secret parts of fortune, oh, most true, she is a strumpet. Strumpet's a hooker, whore. Okay? Truth, take it back. Hooker takes money for sex. A whore just sleeps around. She's a whore. Right? Why? Fortune affects everything. Not just people. It affects us bodily. Within, I don't know how long, a million years, this will decompose. This whole, God, please, this whole building will decompose. You know, maybe something prettier will be built in its place. Everything sleeps with fortune. It's a uh, popular idea in Shakespeare's sonnet. Fortune and time, he often does that with, okay? So he asks, what's the news? What's up? None, my lord, but the world's grown honest. So what would you think if you met some friends that you hadn't seen in a while, because he has not seen them in a long time, <coughs> and you said, what's up? And those friends said to you, the world is getting to be a better place. Most people would go, really? Prove it, show me. Hamlet's perspective is, then is doomsday near. Remember what um, the minister in the minister's black veil said? When the lover shows his inmost self to the beloved, when the family or the friend shows, to, then deem me, you know, a monster. What does he mean then? That's a judgment kind of thing, okay? Then it's doomsday near. We must be getting to, near to the end of the world. But your news is not true. That is, you lied to me. Let me ask you in more particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison preserved? What have you done 
Then fortune sent you to prison in Denmark. Prison, my boy? Denmark's a prison. Then is the real one. Notice, Rosencrantz says, well, if Denmark's a prison, then the whole world's a prison. He extrapolates from the small to the large, from the microcosm to the macrocosm. Hamlet, a goodly one. You're right, the world is a prison in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. You're right, Rosencrantz, the world is a prison. And there are all kinds of prisons. There's Germany, there's England, there's France. But Denmark's one of the worst. And I, I told my first class, I don't know that this is the case, but I can't help but see a anti-illusion here. Illusion, a reference to something else, but this is an anti, not A-N-T-I. This stands in place of what, that, what it possibly is alluding to. And here's where I think it alludes to. Just before, within a few hours, before Christ goes to be crucified, he's having a long talk with his disciples. And he says, I'm going. And where I'm going, I'm going to my father's house in which there are many rooms and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Okay, what's the house? Heaven. What are the rooms? The places various quote unquote saved people go to. What's Hamlet saying? The world down here is what? It's like a dungeon. Look at the language he says. What many confines, wards, and dungeons being one of the worst. Where are dungeons built? Are they on the top floor? Usually, no. They're subterranean. They're beneath the earth. Think of the, usually the hierarchy that's drawn is heaven's up here, earth, hell's down below dungeons, okay? Rosencrantz, we think not so, my lord. That is, we, Rose, Gildenstern and I, we don't think Earth's a dungeon. Then it's not to you. No, it's short, simple, declarative. Tis not to you, for there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it's a prison. There's nothing either good or bad, but think he makes it so. Is Hamlet a quote-unquote moral relativist or an epistemological knowledge relativist? Does he say, I make up my own reality by what I think? Could we take Hamlet's statement and prove it by opening those windows and say, I'm a bird, I can fly. Today, I identify as a bird. And what's going to happen? I can identify as a bird or feather as much as I want. Gravity is still going to prove me wrong. Hamlet doesn't mean that. Hamlet does mean how we look at things can affect on how we perceive them. Okay? And notice what he's talking about. He's talking about good and bad. He's not talking about physical reality. Okay? Paul, in one of his letters, I can't remember which one, He's talking to people who eat and people who don't eat. Those who fast and don't fast. Those who eat meat and those who only eat vegetables. And he says to the, those who eat meat, to not look down, to not judge those who only eat vegetables. He says, for those who eat vegetables, he calls them the weak-minded. Not mean to offend anybody. He says, for those who eat only vegetables, they look at eating meat as evil. For them, because they think it's evil to eat meat, what? It is evil to eat meat. It's wrong for them. It's bad for them. He says, for those who eat meat and vegetables, nothing is, is forbidden. For them, nothing is forbidden. All right? What's his point? Because somebody thinks something is wrong, what should they then do? not do that thing that they think is wrong. 
What did Polonius, what was Polonius' final bit of advice to his son? To thine own self be true, and then it follows that thou canst be false to no man. And what he was talking about there is following one's inner moral compass. If you believe something is wrong and then you do it, what problem do you have? Your conscience tells you, I did something wrong. I don't mean wrong, two plus two equals five. I mean, you commit some moral sin, offense, okay? So, Hamlet goes on. For there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, Denmark's a prison. Rosengren, well, I know why. Your ambition makes it one. What do you mean by Hamlet's ambition? What is Hamlet ambitious for? Ambition implies there's something that he wants that he can't get. There's more that he wants that he can't achieve. Tis too narrow for your mind. Oh, look at you, Hamlet. You want to be, what, king of the universe? Look what he says in response. I can be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. That's what this is. Here's Hamlet. Here's the nutshell. He says, and I could be inside that shell and I could count that space where I was in being infinite. All right? In the, I don't remember what decade, mid 20th century, an astronomer, cosmologist named Edwin Hubble came up with what's called the Hubble constant. The Hubble constant is the speed at which the universe is expanding. And it's a constant because it's the same speed. Little problem, the James Webb Telescope has thrown the Hubble constant into doubt because according to images from the James Webb Telescope, cosmologists are now saying parts of the universe, if I remember correctly, parts of the universe are moving faster than other parts, which leaves a huge question mark, why? Anyways. So the universe is expanding at a constant rate, according to Edwin Hubble. Question, what's it expanding into? <coughs> Isn't the universe supposedly everything that exists? So what's outside everything that exists? Nothing? It can't be, logically speaking. There can't be nothing that something expands into. That's Hamlet's point. Shakespeare didn't know what it's about at the time, okay? So he says, I could be a king of infinite space bounded by a nutshell, but he doesn't stop there. Were it not that I have bad dreams. Notice, I could be, but I have bad dreams. What's Hamlet's point? Where did dreams? Why, uh, excuse me, Guildenstern, which dreams indeed are ambition? Ah, oh, well, that's the problem, Hamlet. Because even though you're in this infinite space, you still have ambition. You want more. If you have infinite space and you're the king of that, how can you want more? Okay? Your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow. The infinite space. It's too small for your mind. Now, I never made the connection before, but I'm kind of wondering, is Guildenstern kind of suggesting that Hamlet's ambition is kind of akin to Satan? Satan, according to traditional Christian theology, the highest of the created order, highest of the angelic beings, and wanted more. Said, I will set my throne above the most high. That is, above the infinite, above God. Hmm, I don't know. So your ambition, 
The very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. Okay, so the substance of the ambitious. So the essence, the reality of the ambitious, that is the thing the ambitious person wants, he says is what? It's merely the shadow of a dream. So the, the thing you want is the shadow of a dream. What are most shadows in dreams? They're insubstantial. They're images, they're evocations. The shadow, you know, they barely see one there. So the substance of the ambitious, the object, okay, is the shadow of a dream. That's, I mean, we're in a deep Plato territory. Hamlet, the dream itself is but a shadow. In other words, did, haven't you guys learned anything at the university? Come on. The dream is a shadow. <coughs> Rosecrans, truly. And I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality that it is but a shadow's shadow. In other words, ambition is nothing. That's why he said at the top of the page, as the indifferent children of the earth. They don't have any ambition. They're just what? Cruising on in life. They're like the stoicism that I mentioned a week or two ago. You don't get really high, you don't get really low, you just, as my stoner friend used to say back in the 70s, you know, just get high and keep on trucking. Just cruise through life. Hamlet. Okay, so if you're right, then are our beggars bodies and our monarchs and outstretched heroes the beggars shadows. So what he means by that is this is the beggar. I hold it up here and you can see the shadow behind me. So this is the beggar and what is the shadow behind me? According to Hamlet. Monarchs and outstretched heroes. What's his point? Monarchs, outstretched probably means heroes who died in heroic acts, right? Because they don't die crouched up. They die like this, defending, protecting others, right? They are what? They're nothing but the images of beggars. Right? This is important because Hamlet is going to bring this exact same terminology up a little bit later. What is Hamlet saying about ultimate reality, so to speak? I don't mean God. I mean the ultimate human person. Beggars. Lowest of the low. Folks, we think we're all this high-minded stuff. Well, he's going to explain that in a moment. So, Hamlet. Shall we to court for by my faith? By my faith, I cannot reason. He's saying, this is too much for me. Is Hamlet being serious in all this? Or is he being... Serious slash facetious. There was a reporter, 2016, 2015, 2016. Politic, I'm using a political example. What your politics are doesn't matter. And, and this doesn't matter politics-wise. The reporter said, trying to, trying to account for Trump's popularity, said, there's a difference between people who take how, how was it she put it? Those who take Trump seriously and those who take him, I think it was literally. Not, it was seriously and it was also started with an S. Anyways, her point is, everything Trump said was not meant to be taken literally. But people should take him seriously. That is, the point, the substance, rather than the actual words. 
Hamlet is kind of saying here, there are some deep problems. But he's also saying, but I can't get to them. Why? Is this part of Hamlet's antic disposition? Honestly, I think from almost, except for his soliloquies, everything Hamlet does and says after he speaks to the ghost, you have to take it with, you know, a cup of salt, a grain of salt. You have to say how much this is true and how much this is totally acting, okay? So, they say, we'll do whatever you want, Hamlet. He gets to his point, why are you here? Come on, why are you here? And they say, oh, should we tell them? Though? You were sent for. Yes, okay, we were sent for. And he says, 276, and I'll tell you why. Because I'm out of sorts, and I don't know why. Does he not know why? Okay. Now, he does know why. What did he say when the ghost mentioned murder most foul? And the serpent that murdered me wears the crown. Oh, my prophetic soul. He had an inkling before. He had a dream or a shadow before of what the cause was. Now he has the body, the substance of it, partially. The body or substance is, the ghost told him, your uncle killed me, okay? So, I know it's 10.05. Everybody leaves, and we're going to pick up uh, on Wednesday with Act 2, Scene 2, when Hamlet delivers his soliloquy okay, at the very end of the scene. Um, I don't think this will matter. I've got a quiz up. I think it's I think it goes active either tomorrow or Wednesday. It's over just Acts 1 and 2. It's due on Friday. Um, I'll go ahead and, and make it live. You don't have to, you can wait till Wednesday if you want. Uh, but we'll finish, we'll do this soliloquy very quickly. And uh, <coughs> go on into Act 3. All right, have a good day.